chapter 3, if you guys got your Bibles. So, if you go to Sand Springs, there is this soccer complex there, and I actually grew up playing at this complex a little bit, but Stephanie and I and the kids went there not too long ago because my nephew was playing a game there, and it's not quite the same complex as it was when I was playing there. It's gotten a lot bigger, and um, they've added some things. One of the things they added was a playground, a very massive playground. It's got like a splash pad there nearby as well. But at this playground, there is this big, massive hill that they built in the center of this playground. And I call it the rubber mat mountain because it's basically got rubber mats and turf on it. But it's, it's just covering the mountain. You know, that's the ground and everything. But you sit back. And if you watch long enough, you'll see these kids just begin to climb up the rubber mat mountain. And they'll go about it different ways. Some will run, some will walk, some will crawl, some will literally jump up this thing. Um, I mean, it's high. I mean, it, it takes a good amount of strength and ability to get up there. Some people, some of the kids go around the backside. There's some steps that they can kind of maneuver around to get up there. But you can also watch the adults do it. And I can speak from personal experience. I have climbed the rubber mat mountain in that park. Um, and what's the goal of climbing it? Why do they want to climb it? Why do they have this desire to climb it? It's to rise to the top, right? It's to elevate ourselves over the playground. And when you get up there, you just subconsciously, naturally have this feeling of, man, this is pretty cool. I've arrived. You, it's like this feeling of control or authority or power. I'm the master of the park up here. It's a sense of worth and belonging and peace and pride and purpose. And you believe deep down, man, this is it right here. This is where I was designed to be. This is where I was meant to be. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Jonathan, nobody actually really thinks that when they're climbing that. They're just climbing the thing. They're having a fun time. So I think you're reading a little too much into a rubber mat mountain in the middle of a park in the middle of Sand Springs. And you're probably reading a little too much into its effects on us psychologically and emotionally and spiritually. But in a similar way, there is a mountain in the middle of our playgrounds, within our houses within our offices, within our schools, within our sports fields, in our auditoriums, in our communities, in our states, in our capitals, in our church buildings. You can't see the rubber mat mountain, but it's there. And just like those kids on that playground and a few adults, we have this deep desire to ascend that mountain. We want to elevate ourselves over the playground, if you will, over our spouse, over our kids, our coworkers, our neighbors, our classmates, others on social media, over the playground. Now, we go about using different means to accomplish ascending that elevation. Some of us crawl, some of us run, some of us walk, some of us jump, some of us go up the backside maneuvering certain steps, if you will. But we believe subconsciously, deep down, that if we could just get to the top of that mountain, then man, we'd be on top of the world. We'd have it all. The feeling of control and authority and power. I can be the master of the playground, a sense of worth and belonging and purpose and peace and pride. We believe that if we could just somehow increase, if we could just somehow ascend the top of that mountain, then we would have arrived knowing, man, this is where I was designed to be. This is where I was meant to be. The reason some of us are saying the things that we're saying to our spouse, the reason you threw that little nugget, that condescending little jab at your spouse the other night, the reason some of us are saying the things that we are to our kids or our neighbors or our fellow believers in this room, the reason some of us have these attitudes that we have, or these certain worldviews and perspectives that are not pleasing to the Lord. The reason we have these things is because we are living according to a misbelief. 
It's a misbelief that is so ingrained in us that we hardly ever question its validity, its origin, its value, and its power on our lives. The misbelief is this. I'm the point. I'm the point. We believe we're the point. That the world was created by us and for us. That we can be master of the playground. That we're the main character, the protagonist, come to save the world. We are the point. So we deserve this. We deserve that elevation. We deserve that status. But let me tell you something. If we want to possess a life that is radically different than the culture's idea of what a life should look like, a life that is different in what we say, a, a life that is different in how we respond to events and stories and words and situations, a life that is different in how we function and move and think and see things in this world. If we want to have a radically rich, healthy, deep relationship with our families, coworkers, neighbors, classmates, teammates, if we want to have the kind of relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ in this room that God expects us to have, if we want a kind of relationship with Jesus that takes us deeper and farther than we ever could have possibly imagined, then we must stop living according to the misbelief that we are the point. And instead, we must believe this and we must live according to it. And it's this. You were designed to point to something, not be the point. I coined that term from a fellow pastor, Chris Freeland, who's pastor in Fort Worth, the church I was at for a little while. But he said, you were designed to point to something, not be the point. Doesn't mean we're not valuable, fearfully and wonderfully and brilliantly and beautifully made. Doesn't mean we don't do powerful, brilliant things in the name of Jesus. Doesn't mean that God didn't create creation for us. What it means is that what we say, how we live, our relationships, our very image as a human being is designed ultimately to point to something, namely someone. We are not designed to be the point. We are not designed to be God, created in his image, yes, to be his kind of reflection, if you will, but not to be God. And if we begin to live life believing that truth, that we're designed to point to God, not be the point, and we stop trying to ascend that rubber mat mountain that we've created in our own image and which is designed to try and elevate us as being the point, then our life won't just radically change, it'll actually begin. And we see this in John chapter 3. So before we look at verse 22 through 36, which is where we'll be, I need to kind of paint the context for you. There are two stories wrapped around this text that we're about to read, and they're real life examples of what it looks like to live believing the misbelief that I'm the point. It's all about me. The first story is about a guy by the name of Nicodemus. Now, we've looked at Nicodemus before. We've looked at that passage before. Nicodemus was well-educated. He was trained in Scripture. He knew everything there was to know about Scripture. He could teach it. He could break it down. He had it memorized. He was well-educated in that. He was also very prosperous in that. He would have been in the elite status, well thought of, very wealthy, very established. But then he comes to Jesus at night seeking answers. Why? Why would a guy like Nicodemus go to a carpenter's son, one from Nazareth? Because the misbelief that you are the point will always inevitably leave you still wanting and searching. You cannot find what you're looking for by looking internally. As C.S. Lewis said, look for yourself and you'll find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. You can literally, because some are doing it in our culture, literally mutilate the flesh in seeking to look internally to find yourself. You will still be found wanting and searching. 
seeking answers. Nicodemus, like us, was living according to the misbelief that he was the point. Thus, as he comes to Jesus, his entire life, he was trying to ascend that mountain, to reach that elevation, which elevated himself over everything and everyone, because, as he would believe, that's what he was designed for, right? His means in which he used to climb that mountain was religion. His means in which he used to climb that mountain was religion. If I just gain enough knowledge, if I just memorize enough, if I just study enough, if I just break down the original text enough, if I just pray and I sing and I sacrifice enough, if I would just do this and do that, if I would just belong to a certain synagogue or teach for so many years and look a certain way and act a certain way and do everything right, then I would arrive. Then I could stand on top of that mountain and say, ah, this is, this is where it's at. Nicodemus believed you could fix the foundation of a house by putting a fresh coat of paint on the outside of the house. It's illogical. The misbelief, regardless of what means you use to live it out, leaves you still dead inside. It still leaves you with the need to be, as Jesus told Nicodemus, born again. So Nicodemus chased religion, or he used religion as a tool in hopes to ascend the mountain, the elevation in which he could finally declare, see, I'm the point. I deserve this. I've obtained this. This is my playground. The second story, after the text we're about to look at, comes in John chapter 4. It's the woman at the well. Again, we've looked at her before, we looked at that passage before. She's a Samaritan woman. Samaritans did not associate with Jews. There, there's ethnic reasons, um, racial reasons, there's religious reasons. Um, they didn't associate with each other. And so for Jesus to be sitting at a well as a male Jew talking to a female Samaritan, it was unheard of. It, it was ridiculous to even be thought of. But what we find out is that she too was trying to climb the same mountain as Nicodemus, as us. But her means of climbing that mountain was not religion, far from it. It was relationships. Man, if I would just find the right person, if I would just obtain, as Disney would say, love's true kiss, if I could just find that true love, then I will have arrived. The woman chased relationships or used relationships in hopes to ascend the mountain. Where she could finally declare, now, now I'm on top of the world. Now I have the feeling of control and authority and power and purpose. Now I'm the master of the playground. See, this is where I was designed to be, meant to be. But see, like Nicodemus with religion, when you use relationships as the means to try and elevate yourself as being the point over others, you will still be left, as we learn in her situation, thirsty, in need of living water. So we know these stories very well, but sometimes we fail to appreciate how the story of Nicodemus and how the story of the woman at the well are connected. There's contrast between the two. Nicodemus was a very elite male figure in the Jewish community. This woman at the well was a poor outcast in the Samaritan community. There's contrast there, but there's an underlying similarity. And that similarity is revealed to us in the story between the stories, which presents another group trying to do what Nicodemus and the woman at the well were doing, only using a different method or means. Look at John chapter 3, verse 22. This is right after Jesus has this encounter with Nicodemus, as we learn. And this is what John writes. You see the words here on the screen. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem. They went into the Judean countryside, and Jesus spent some time with them there, baptizing people. Now John would later tell us that Jesus wasn't the one actually baptizing them, but his disciples were. But verse 23, at this time... John the Baptist, John the baptizer, was baptizing at Anon near Salim, 
because there was plenty of water there, and the people kept coming to him for baptism. Verse 24, this was before John was thrown into prison, John tells us, the different John. Verse 25, a debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over ceremonial cleansing. Stop right there. So John the Baptist, John is the one who Jesus would later say, man, there, of anyone born of a woman, there's no one greater than John. And he's related to Jesus, and he has been sent basically to prepare the way for Jesus. He's like the Elijah in Jesus' day, to prepare the way. And so John was preaching repentance, and he was baptizing people in the name of this repentance. Repent from your sins and turn to God. And John had gathered a significant following, significant crowds. But then here comes Jesus. And already earlier on in John's gospel, John the Baptist said, man, he is the Lamb of God. He is the Messiah. He is worthy than me, worthier than me. He's greater than me, so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, verse 25, we have this debate break out between John's followers and a certain Jew or a certain set of Jews over ceremonial cleansing. In other words, the debate, as we would learn from their response in the next verses, the debate is about who's baptism carries more weight. In other words, John, should I be baptized by Jesus' followers or your followers? Which one gets me more pure? Which one has more power? Your baptism or his baptism? Now this is a big deal because clearly many had started to say, we ought to be baptized by Jesus and his followers. Based off of what John the Baptist said. Man, he is the Lamb of God. He is the Christ. I'm not even worthy to mess about with his shoes. But also Jesus had a lot of fame spreading himself. He was doing miracles. Either way, people were beginning to leave John's following and join Jesus. As a matter of fact, Andrew, Peter's brother, was one of those. He was a follower of John the Baptist. He left John the Baptist to follow Jesus. And this did not sit well with the followers of John the Baptist. Oh, you're going to that church over there? Not only did it not sit well, but now you have a Jew or a set of Jews coming up and saying, hey, we think Jesus' baptism is actually better for us than getting baptized by you. So they start doing the comparison game. So what happens? Look at verse 26. Don't miss this. So John's disciples came to him after this debate, after this argument. People are leaving at this point. They're joining Jesus, and now this argument's coming about. And so he said, they said to him, Rabbi, means teacher, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people. Hear this. And everybody is going to him Instead of coming to us. Did you hear that? I'll read it again. Everybody is going to him instead of coming to us. Besides that, notice this. They couldn't even bring themselves to say Jesus' name. Did you notice that? They never once said Jesus' name. No, that guy that you were talking about, that one over there, that one. Because they believed, and it's clear in their words, that they were the point. It's about us. We're losing our following. We're losing our popularity and our fame. See, Nicodemus was chasing religion, using religion as the means to ascend the mountain. The woman at the well was chasing relationships, using relationships as the means or the tool to elevate herself on that mountain. They, though, John's followers, were chasing renown. They were using renown to try and elevate themselves, not just over other people, but Jesus himself. And it's very funny, when we believe the misbelief that we are the point, when we use religion or relationships or renown to try and elevate ourselves over others, including God himself, and we declare, see, I'm the point, when we do that, we end up 
doing two things. Not talking to Jesus, we don't pray. And when we are forced to talk about him, we usually don't want to actually say his name. That's why some of us never say Jesus' name on any given week. Matter of fact, we'll get creative about using bland, vague statements about going to church or good preacher or good music or pretty floors. We do a roundabout way of actually not talking about Jesus. We do nearly everything possible to not actually put the name of Jesus on our lips. Why? Because subconsciously, so many of us are just like them. We believe he's not the point. We are. This is why it's easier for us to invite someone to a specific church than to actually just talk to them about Jesus. Because not only do we not have to say Jesus' name in that context, but if they do come, they'll be talking about us and our brand and our church name, and that's good because what we're doing is chasing that mountain. Using renown and relationships and religion to get there, to decrease Jesus, but to increase ourselves. So according to our misbelief, why would I point to Jesus? Because if I did, what would people think of me? What if they left me and started going to him? If we believe that we are the point, you will not pray and you will not tell anyone about Jesus. Not only that, but you will be left dead inside, needing to be born again, and needing to encounter the living water. Everybody's going to him instead of coming to us. So what's John's reply? Verse 27. So John replies, remember who John is. Jesus said there's no one greater than John the Baptist. John has, yes, he's the guy who eats locusts and honey and lives out in the wilderness, and he's kind of weird in that sense, but man, he's got a huge following, right? He can preach it. What does he say? No one can receive anything unless God gives it to him from heaven. Verse 28, you yourselves know how plainly I told you, clearly I told you this. I am not the Messiah. I'm not the point. I am only, hear what John said, I'm only here to prepare the way for him. I'm only here, my purpose, my design is to point to him. And then he uses this illustration, verse 29, it's the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad just to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I'm filled with joy at his success. Verse 30, he must become greater and greater. He must increase, and I must become less and less. I must decrease. So again, he uses the wedding analogy. When you sit at a wedding, and you're waiting, and you're waiting... And finally, the the bride and the groom are up there on the stage. In that moment, nobody's looking at the best man. Nobody's looking at the maid of honor. The wedding's not about them. You're looking at the bride and the groom, and this is John's point. This is not about me. I'm not the point. Jesus is. But wait, John, how can you say that? We're the point, not him. We can't just drift off into obscurity. What about our renown? What about us? As if knowing those questions are going to come about, look at verse 31. Jesus has come from above. We haven't. He has. And he's greater than anyone else. We are of the earth. We speak of earthly things. But he has come from heaven and is greater than anyone else. He testifies about what he has seen and heard, but how few people actually believe what he tells them. Verse 33, anyone who does accept his testimony can affirm that God is true, for he is sent by God. He speaks God's words, for God gives him the spirit without limit. The father loves his son, who Jesus is, and has put everything into Jesus' hands. And anyone who believes in God's son, who is Jesus, has eternal life. And anyone who doesn't obey the son will never experience eternal life, but will remain under God's angry judgment. As Jesus would earlier say to Nicodemus, if you don't 
believe, you stand condemned. Listen, if we want eternal life, if we want our lives to begin, to be born again, to taste the living water, if we want to follow Jesus, then we must stop living according to the misbelief that we are the point. We are designed to point to Jesus, not to be the point. He must increase, we must dis- decrease. If we do not live according to that, we'll continue just running up that hill, up that rubber mat mountain over and over and over again, using religion, using relationships, using work, using renown, climbing it again and again, going nowhere. Just like Nicodemus, just like the woman at the well, we will go nowhere. There was a, a little boy who had a pet gerbil. And I know what you're thinking, who in the world would have a pet gerbil, right? Because they're just little mice. And I've grown up to hate mice, and for some reason we had little gerbil when we were kids, and I think it's because of that. But anyways, this kid had a pet gerbil, and one day he got his gerbil, and he took the gerbil into the room in his little cage, and he set the gerbil down, and then he got some pieces of paper and some crayons and markers and everything, and he began to draw. And he drew different pictures. He drew mountains. He drew rivers. He drew lakes and ponds. He drew cities. He drew highways. He drew um, even one of the space with the stars and the planets and everything. And so he drew all these pictures, like 10, 12 of them, and then he put them up all around his room. And then he told his dad to come into the room because he wanted to show him something. So the dad says, sure. And so the dad's in the room, and, and the son proceeds to get the gerbil, and he put him in kind of this enclosed spinning wheel. If you've ever seen a gerbil and those spinning wheels, a little mouse or something, right? They get those spinning wheels, they just around and around and around, around. So he puts that little gerbil in that spinning wheel, and he proceeds to put that spinning wheel in front of every picture. And as he did that, the gerbil would, right in front of the picture, just would begin to run, 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 run. And he'd put him in the next picture. He'd just run, 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 run. And the next picture, he'd just run, 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 run. And just put him in the next picture, run, 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 run. And finally, the son said, Dad, look. He can walk on water. He can run in the mountains. He can run in the cities. He can run in space. He can run everywhere. He can run all over the world. And he was so impressed by this, and the dad said, oh, that's so cool, it's very creative and imaginative and everything. But then the dad decided to burst the little kid's bubble. He said, son, that's great and awesome, but you do realize that if you don't take him out of the cage, he's running nowhere, place. And I thought about that story, and I'm like, man, that's just a picture of so many of us. We go from work to activity to sporting event, to vacation, to church, to work. And some of, many of us were just run, 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 and we're going nowhere. Just feels like we're running in place, trying to chase ourselves, one rung after another after another, over and over trying to ascend that mountain. So we might ask, what's the point? Ecclesiastes, the author there says, basically the world just keeps going around and around. We come and go and that's it. So what's the point? Well, it's really the wrong question. The question really is not what's the point, it's who's the point? And here's the cool thing about that rubber mat mountain thing in the park in Sand Springs. They carved a tunnel out at its bottom. And so they made a way for you to go from this side of the mountain to this side. And you don't have to climb the mountain. And here's the cool thing about Jesus. We denied him for our little mountains. We rebelled against him for our mountains. However, Jesus, some 2,000 years ago, ascended the mountain that we created for ourselves. And at its elevation, he was hung on a tree like a nasty snake for our sins. 
He became our sin. He was obedient unto death, even death on a cross. And so what did God do? God elevated him. He's the point. God elevated him to the top of the mountain of all mountains. His playground, if you will. But he didn't stop there. He opened a door, a tunnel to the other side. He made a way for you and I to go from here to here. From death into life, from darkness into light, from non-child status to child status. And all he, has to, all he said was, listen, you don't have to climb the mountain anymore. All you got to do is stop believing the misbelief that you're the point. That it's about me, not about you. You were designed to point to Jesus. So just believe in him, that he's the point. You decrease, he increases. And if you would do that, you would be saved. And Jesus would enter into your life and penetrate every area of your life. And you would find that, man, if I would lose myself for his sake, I would find my life. My life would actually begin. As Jesus said, the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So in other words, Jesus is inviting us to get out of the cage. Quit running over and over and over in place or up that mountain, trying to use religion, trying to use relationships, or trying to use renown and all these things to try to elevate yourself to that arrival moment. You're going nowhere. You will go nowhere. Jesus is saying, listen, I've set you free. Just believe in me. And I've designed you to point to me. And when you do, you will find life and life eternally. As Lewis said, look for yourself. And you'll find in the long run only hatred, loneliness, despair, rage, ruin, and decay. But if you look for Christ, you will find him and with him everything else thrown in. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to invite the worship team and the band forward to lead us in a time of response. And there's so many of us, I think, if we were being honest, maybe we're watching online or here in person, we find ourselves either in the shoes of Nicodemus, we've tried religion to try to elevate ourselves, but man, we still find ourselves searching because we're still dead inside. You can't fix the foundation by painting the outside walls. It doesn't work. Or maybe we're like the woman at the well. We've been chasing relationships after another, after another, after another, trying to find that true love, that person that pulls on all the right emotional and sensual strings, but we're still found thirsty. Or maybe we're like John the Baptist's followers in this moment. So using our renown to try to elevate ourselves that we can't even say the name of Jesus. If we're being honest, the only reason we invite people to church is that hopefully we'll grow big enough to elevate ourselves. All of those things will leave you in a cage running in circles going nowhere. It's only when we recognize that Jesus is above everyone and is greater than everyone when we believe that Jesus is the point, not ourselves. It's only then will our marriages change and our families and our workplaces and our schools and, and even our churches. When we decide that we must decrease and he must increase. So in this moment of response, I'm going to pray here in a moment. Maybe some of you, you, you just got to confess some things. You got to turn from some things. Maybe some of you just want to get to that point to where John said, man, Lord, you're greater than me. You're greater than me. You're greater than everyone. Elevate yourself in my life. Some of us, for the first time, we need to go through that tunnel, if you will, the way in which Jesus made for us to no longer have to climb that mountain. Some of us need to get it out of the cage. And the only way we do that is look upon the one who hung on a tree for you. And don't disbelieve, but believe. That he died for you and three days later conquered your sin and death in bodily resurrection. And he's king. Make him king of your life. So as I pray, you can begin to come down.
Father, we come to you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we don't have to work for it. I'm going to pray that we would recognize that we can't work for it. Finding the right relationship, using religion, chasing renown, none of these things will save us. It's only when we recognize that we were designed to point to you and not to be the point. It's only when we deny ourselves and pick up our crosses and follow you that we find life. So Lord, humble us in this place. Let, let us, in every area of our lives, take the attitude that we must decrease and you must increase. Lord, help us to live under the lordship of Jesus and help us to speak to Jesus and help us to speak for Jesus. Not trying to elevate ourselves, but elevate Jesus. Lord, I pray in this room here this morning, or maybe at home who's watching, Lord, I pray that you bring salvation, bring renewal, bring growth, bring change, bring conviction, bring obedience to your glory and praise. In Jesus' name I pray. I'm going to ask that you guys...